uh, six records of the species occurrence, you can also uh, enter with that information. You would not be a raster because you don't have the distribution of the species, but it will be a file with what is what species is that and what are the coordinates of the point you are using. Okay? Once you're using the X and Y coordinate, all this is uh, goes to a GIS file. So it must be georeferenced. And then the outputs files will be it will always give you some pictures of the maps you're using. It will be uh, these files. It will give you the species performance curves in a text file that you can use after in Excel or anything. And it will give you all the rest of files. So a raster of ranking, what are the most important cells in your uh, region. Uh, a raster for the smallest proportion remaining means what is the, the level of protection I'm getting in, in the area. And you can work with all these files in any GIS software you want. Okay? They're just uh, text-like files that you can run. And it will also give you some kind of log. A run file, there is a text file that contains all the parameters of the analysis and what a zonation uh, actually did during the run and, and you can get back there to check uh, problems to see if anything goes, went wrong or just to check out what are the parameters you are using because you want to do another analysis and you just don't remember what you did before. So, donation has now been used for, in, in many studies, doing different things. I picked up this case study, and in fact, Ate Moilani sent me a couple of slides, and I'm just using it. This is a case study from the evaluation of the proposed bank to proportion, uh, protected areas in New Zealand. It's a paper published by John Leithwick, Conservation Letters, 2008. So, the aim of this uh, planning was to evaluate the proposed, the proposed New Zealand's benthic protected areas. So here you have uh, New Zealand, this is the two islands, the North Island and the Southern One. And this is ocean. These uh, light blue areas are not reserves and the dark blues are existing reserves they have. So they're trying to uh, make a priority plan in which they are indicating what are the proposed reserves that the government proposed and what are the places that they should place another protected areas to meet, uh, to get the most beneficial uh, return for that plan. They did this for uh, 1.59 million cells with one kilometer uh, square grids, using data for 100 demersal fish species and habitat models, and 20 environmental variables. And they have used locations of commercial trolls as a cost data. So they have a constraint of places that were not interesting for conservation because of uh, fisheries, for example. <clears throat> and then you run this into zonation. What you get is, again, this is the islands and this is sea. And you're seeing a kind of priority ranking for the whole surface you are trying to protect. It goes from the cells that are worthless or less important in your planning, sorry, and cells, these blue ones, that are the most important cells, the 10% best cells, the top 10% cells of your area. It means that if you want to protect, if you're a uh, target area is to protect 10% of this whole system, you should invest your resource in those blue areas. Do you understand that? Yes. If you want to protect about 25%, uh, then you should take a look at all those places, blue and green areas. That will be 25% of the area. Okay? So it's a top ranking map. And then you have this performance curve. Uh, here it says in, in, in the X, 
uh, axis has the proportion of cells removed, it is because of the way the algorithm, uh, the zonation uses work. I'll get to this in a minute. So here you have uh, all the landscape protected, and, and here you have none of the landscape protected, okay? We're losing uh, habitat from here to here, right? And here you have the proportion of species distribution protected. And you have here four curves. There are four, uh, basic planning with all species, a basic planning that considered only endemic species, and some weighted results, and giving more importance to some species. And <clears throat> what you can see is that for a given uh, a percent of total area, like 10% of the area should be protected. In that graph, it means that you have lost 90%, okay? So if you're protecting 10%, you can take a look at this place and compare the curves. And you see that this light blue one, it's a basic planning in which endemic species have all the same weight. They're just as important as any other species. And this one is where endemic species uh, have, uh, has been weighted, have been weighted higher. So what you get is for the same amount of area protected, you will be able to protect about 40% of the distribution of each endemic species. And when you weight higher the endemic species, this value of distribution remaining increases to something about 50%. So you're getting 10% more of the dis on, on average proportion of each species protected, okay? Just because you have weighted them more or higher than the other species. So you can actually get a uh, better performance of uh, the representation of your targets if you work with weights. I'll get to that too. We will have uh, an exercise working with weights to different species and we'll check these curves. Then you can also <clears throat> look at these curves and see what is the effect of including costs in your analysis. This is very interesting because the curves are so different. Here you have a performance curves for a kind of ideal solution. I would call this, I would call this naive solution. So you're looking to biodiversity and you're not considering any other aspect involved in the planning. Okay, you just want to maximize the proportion of the biodiversity you are protecting within uh, the places you're saying uh, are the better ones. So if you take a look at the 10% again, you see that? If you do not include any cost, then you can have about 50% of the distribution, on average, 50% of the distribution of species will be protected. But then when you insert a layer of cost, then you say that costs are important and that there are some places that are very costly and you can't use them. <clears throat> you get a totally different solution that goes down like this and then came here. And you can see that for the same 10%, you're only getting about 10 to 15% of the distribution. So why is that? Why does this happen? This is the difference in uh, species representation you get when you include costs. Why this curve does something like this? What do you think? Why, when I include the costs uh, in the analysis, I get a lower representation of the species than when I just ignore the costs. Anyone? The thing here is that cost is important, right? It can really change the solution you have. Any ideas? Why should I expect that? Perhaps what is happening is that the places I'm really 
able to select because the software goes and he wants to select a place and then he looked at the costs and he said, oh, oh, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is not cheap. Okay, so I have to go to another place. And then it goes to another place and he eventually select that, that other place. The thing is that when you include costs, you're picking up sites. They're not necessarily the best ones for representing species. Okay? But they're cheap. They will make your solution feasible. But there is a trade-off there. You can consider the costs. It is important. But you've got to be prepared to have some loss of biological uh, protection. And it's the actual effect of including cost in your analysis. You can go to other places that are cheap. They're not as good as uh, that place for doing conservation exactly because they're not as good for doing anything like agriculture or any stuff like that. So it's a remote area, it's a place uh, with no biodiversity, it's a place with a very harsh environment, and if sometimes if it is hard to humans to be there, it will be also hard to biodiversity, other aspects of biodiversity to be there. So you don't get the same level of representation because you're picking up sites that are not necessarily interesting for conservation. But they're cheap. The, the cost factor too, does that relate? Does it relate to the cost involving to set up a reserve in a particular place or the cost that it involves perhaps industry? Um, how do we relate to that? Mm -hmm. element of cost. Okay, could that that cost could be pretty much anything you were using. The thing is that cost is constraining the selection of sites. Mm -hmm. So we're not more free to select any site because there is a cost associated to it. But the cost could be associated to the person planning the reserve. It could also relate to, for example, if it's a fishery sector that might want to be utilizing a particular area for fishing. Mm -hmm. So how does donation deal with the cost elements? Or do, do you enter the cost elements, including if it would affect fisheries, including the cost it would take to set up the reserve in a particular area? Are all of these elements included into that variable? Mm -hmm. You can have, well, you can have it separated, like a lot of different costs or you can have a combined cost that uh, translates into everything like that. That's, that's not the problem. You can, you can have separate things or all combined, okay? But the thing, uh, using cost, you can have this kind of solution. So this is somewhat related to your question. You have fishing opportunity costs, right? That increases, no good for fisheries. They're losing money because you're protecting areas and then cannot fish there. And you have conservation benefits, like the amount of species you are protecting, okay? So in that ideal solution, let's say that your target is to protect 20% of that economic exclusive zone, right? Under this free solution, ideal solution, when there is no constraints and costs, you're just thinking about maximizing biodiversity, <clears throat> you can have that amount of protection, almost 48, 49% of the species are being protected here. But then when we include costs in zonation, fishery costs or, or fishing opportunity costs, you can have a solution like this. Look, you see that the cost of the solution is pretty, pretty, pretty much lower than the other one. But the amount of conservation benefit you're getting is also low. Not that low. It's an interesting solution because you're losing something about 10% of conservation benefit, but you're reducing more than 50% uh, the costs of the action. And the lowest the cost, the higher the chances you get the, the plan really being established in any place. Okay? So you have this interesting situation. If you take a look at the existing protected areas in New Zealand, they're covering about 30% of species. And they have about 18% of cost for, fish, for fishermen, like opportunity costs uh, for fishermen. 
So fisheries have proposed any strategy to select some areas for conservation that will end up protecting about 12% of biodiversity, but with very low opportunity cost for them, 0.2. That's very good if you want to exploit uh, resources from the sea. Not necessarily good for biodiversity. So, if you don't include costs in zonation, you can have a very high level of representation of species, like 31%, but costs will be high too. This is not an interesting solution. If these guys want such a low cost and you are giving them a very high cost, there will be no discussion, okay? You can't resonate with that. So if you include the cost in the analysis, and that's what uh, Lithwick and colleagues have done, you will end up with 29% of species representation and 1.6% of uh, fishing opportunity costs. This is a more interesting solution. So you have reduced costs. It's a little bit higher than what they would want to, but it's pretty much higher, more than <laughs> two times higher what, they, what you will get in terms of conservation benefit if you implement that strategy and not this one. And now you have something to negotiate. You can say, look, okay, I'm increasing a little the fishing opportunity costs, but I'm getting much more benefits from conservation. So we, have, we need to discuss that. It's not this, it's not this that the, these guys won't accept, but it's a more reasoned solution that we can discuss and try to establish some things. So, uh, the basic analysis of zonations will be, of zonation will be the identification of optimal reserve areas. So where, where should I put uh, money to build reserves, for example? The identification of least valuable areas means what are the places that I definitely don't want to spend money on to protect biodiversity. And evaluation of conservation errors, a kind of uh, gap analysis, so you can include conservation error, uh, existing conservation errors, uh, protected errors in the analysis, and run the analysis again without them, so you can see what is the effect of including uh, uh, protected errors, okay? You see how, how, how big is the amount of the distribution being protected by protected areas right now. And you, of course, can use it to expand conservation areas and try to propose a new uh, places, new places for species conservation, okay? That will be the basic things. So Nation does a lot of, has a lot of other features. It can include uh, weight for species. It can use species-specific connectivity requirements. So you can try to, um, to clump solutions so you have more compacted solutions in terms of n not many cells really spread through your, the, the, the region you're planning, but some kind of clumped solutions which will be more easy to work. You could do that by managing the landscape, like uh, penalizing the solution for a very different rate between uh, area and length, okay, of your solution. Or you can have some kind of species specific requirements. You can enter the, how much of the landscape this piece will use, so you can recalculate the actual distribution and try to uh, say where the species will be and where the places should be apart from one another so you minimize that dispersal distance, okay? Uh, you can balance alternative land uses using different types of costs. So one cost could be uh, land use cost, the other can be opportunity cost for agriculture, for example, uh, places where urbanization are priority, uh, places with uh, huge human population density that will preclude any kind of uh, area setting. And you can link the results with GIS, uh, software distribution modeling, and work with all that. So it's very integrative 
uh, in a sense that you can do work in the QGIS, you can have results from Maxin, and you can get all into uh, the zonation framework and try to get and trying to have a solution. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the most important things is to understand what is actually the zonation algorithm.